Hey everybody, it's time for another Basement Breakdown, and as usual, I'll be looking deep into the most memorable images from an episode of TV. We're probing beneath the surface, because once you start poking your head around down there, you never know what you'll find. Let's get going. Better Call Saul, Season 6, Episode 3, Rock and Hard Place. I'll start with the opening shot. It is just the one shot we see before the opening credits, but it's a long one with complex motion involved. The camera is acting as a storyteller here, speaking to us in a rich but somewhat mysterious language of image and motion. This shot is designed to be experienced twice. The first time you see the shot, it's largely an aesthetic experience. There's very little specific meaning to discern from what we see. But at the end of the episode, you experience the shot a second time, through your memory of it at least, maybe later by actually re-watching the episode. And that second time around, of course, we know what happens. Once we know what happens, these visuals tell a more particular story. Some of the images take on a specific meaning. Then again, some of them don't, which is perhaps even more fascinating. I do want to emphasize this. Don't forget that first time. Don't forget that before all the details get filled in, these images have to speak for themselves, be beautiful in themselves with very little context. That's part of the artistry in this sort of cryptic, wordless opening sequence, which is a common device in both Breaking Bad and in Better Call Saul. So let's start with an aesthetic reading. What story does the camera have to tell in this opener? Well, at first it's a pretty Spartan one, right? There's an aspect of the tease to this camera motion. When the camera starts to move, you naturally expect it to arrive somewhere. That's kind of what camera moves do. And they tend to show you something along the way, right? Nope, not here. For a long stretch, this camera move refuses to do any of that. We're following the lines of this dried out plant downward. And when we get to the bottom, there's nothing there. Okay, now we're pushing past this rock, back over this chunk of dead wood where we're gonna find more dead wood. Before you know it, we are an entire minute into the episode and all we've seen is a bunch of dead and dried out stuff. All you hear is the thin, desiccated clicks and buzzes of insects. And after a while, one distant thunderclap that hints at the coming turn. I don't know about you, but after a full minute of looking at a bunch of dead and dried out stuff in the middle of the desert... My natural expectation is the next thing I see will be dead, and in all likelihood, dried out. Instead, we see this. A flower that, thanks to all the time we just spent looking at brown and slightly darker brown, looks incredibly blue and ridiculously alive. It seems impossible that this flower could be surviving here, let alone growing, bursting with color. This flower is the pivot point of the opening sequence, right? Visually, everything revolves around it. When we see the flower, the color temperature shifts from very warm to cool. The soundtrack transforms from dry clicks and buzzes to the soft, gentle wash of rainfall. This flower is the first time this camera move comes to a stop again. We're going to keep track of all the places where the camera stops because those are inherently important in the storytelling language of the camera. So the blue flower is one stop. Mark it down. The next pause in the motion comes when the camera drifts to this frame in peculiar fashion. Why did we stop here? What is the subject of the shot at this moment? There's none apparent. Maybe this rock in the middle of the frame, but it's not quite in focus. The picture lacks a clear subject because it's a picture of absence. The emptiness of the frame is the point. And look, when I say it's a picture of absence, I don't mean that the first time I watch this, I'm sitting here thinking, ah, mmm, a picture of absence. I'm sitting here thinking, huh? What am I looking at? Taking it all in for the first time. That's part of the experience. Don't be afraid to say, huh? I say it all the time especially because I know by now that those huh moments are where the real fun starts. As long as you follow up that perplexity with some curiosity, you can start to get some interesting answers from the artwork before you. What are we looking at here? Well, the frame tells me nothing. Why are we looking at nothing? What's missing? 
Those prove to be the important questions. The camera stays still long enough for us to notice the absence and start to ask those questions, not in so many words maybe, but in our processing of the scene. Now we arrive at the camera's final stop. The picture is underlined by some plink plink foley art that basically grabs the viewer by the lapels and says, hey, look at that shard of glass. If you remember anything from this opening scene, remember that shard of glass. The sound effect is a neon sign pointing at Chekhov's gun and the sign says, this thing's gonna be important, as Chekhov's gun typically is. In this way, the glass shard also echoes the image at the end of the Wine and Roses montage, which fixated on that bottle topper, another sharp object depicted in close-up amid a cleansing flow of water, and another instance of the show saying, hey everybody, this thing's going to be important. The question is how. You can't miss the glass shard, right? And it's a good thing because the opener is so cryptic, you have to give the viewer something to hang their hat on. And here it is. Plink, plink, plink. It comes off as an incidental addition to the sound mix, but that plink, plink, plink sound allows the editors to direct our focus where it needs to be in the frame. Without plink, 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 the shard of glass, yeah, you'd notice it, but it might just read as debris. You wouldn't have that reassurance of, yeah, you're supposed to be looking at this thing. That's a simple but important concept to understand about audio and motion pictures. Often the sound mix is about directing the viewer's eye. So here are the camera stops in the opening. I've been keeping track. And you've probably noticed there's a gap in my little diagram here. Maybe I'm just terrible at graphic design, but actually there is one more time the camera is still, and that's at the very beginning. We open on a wide angle of this rocky landscape with this U-shaped notch in the ridge. Maybe you didn't take much note of it the first time you saw it. I certainly didn't. It's designed to hide in plain sight. So those are the four times the camera stops to take a picture, and they are the four pieces of the puzzle, so to speak, in this opening sequence. Now that we've been through this shot from a first-time point of view, I'm going to work back through these images and connect some dots, starting with that notch, which is a pretty simple dot to connect. It establishes location. We see this notch here at the opening, and later Mike is dropped off on the other side of it. So we know the opening shot and the climax of the episode occupy the same space. We know, not that you would ever doubt it, that this shard of glass is the shard of glass. And let's talk about that glass. Images of glass have featured prominently in Nacho's storyline lately. We saw him share a toast with Don Eladio in the season 5 finale. Salut. And later in that episode, he does the same with Lalo. To sleep, and those who need it, to sleep. Both times raising a glass as he perpetuates a high-stakes fiction about himself. The moment Lalo begins to understand Nacho's deception is portrayed with a rack focus from Nacho's glass to Lalo's gaze. And of course, there's Fring's glass and Carrot and Stick which shatters as they discuss what to do about Nacho. And I talked about that odd little interlude in my last video. In those toast scenes with Eladio and Lalo, Nacho's glass stands for a story he's telling about himself. I'm with you. We drink from the same bottle because we're on the same team. That's the story of a toast, typically, right? Now, Nacho's glass has broken. That story he was telling has gone to pieces. As we've seen for Gus, the question is, how am I going to clean these pieces up? But the question for Nacho is, what, if anything, can I do with my shard of my own shattered narrative? And that's ultimately the only question that matters to anyone as this crisis comes to a head. Yes, the shard of glass allows Nacho to gain a physical advantage at the crucial moment, but the real weapon he wields in the final scene is the story he chooses to tell when he gets one last opportunity to speak. What a joke. Alvarez has been paying me for years. That's what the shard of glass truly represents to me. Nacho's crucial and dangerous piece of the story surrounding the attack on Lalo. On the night before the fateful showdown, we see Nacho refracted in his drinking glass. It's a visual suggestion of the literal breakage that produces his smuggled weapon, because presumably this is the actual glass he breaks, right? But more meaningfully, as Nacho considers all these overlapping, incomplete images of himself, it's as if he's conjuring all the different versions of Nacho he could conjure for the cartel. 
the different overlapping mixes of truth and fiction he could craft when the moment comes. Nacho also shares a drink with Mike in this episode, and the similarity raises the question, is this a drink like the ones he shared with the Don and with Lalo? By which I mean, is Nacho wearing a mask of cooperation with Mike while making his own secret plans? I mean, I think the answer is obviously yes, and that's the parallel, right? But the difference between the scenes is that unlike those other guys, Mike to some degree assumes that Nacho's cooperation is superficial. Yes, Mike rehearses the Fring-approved storyline with Nacho. They talk through what's supposed to happen. But Mike has no illusions around the reality that Nacho will act of his own accord. What happens now? That's up to you. So there is a distance between Mike and Nacho here insofar as Mike doesn't know what Nacho will do. But the dynamic between Mike and Nacho in this scene and throughout the episode is clearly about what they share. What they share is a core belief that amid the ugliness of the game, there still ought to be a limit, a boundary to the play field beyond which people are left alone. Nacho and Mike accept the consequences of their own choices for themselves, but you leave those other people alone, right? Nacho's other people is his father. My dad. I need to know that he'll be safe. Mike's other people are his daughter-in-law and grandkid. Plus, in another way, the true blue cop son who Mike couldn't protect. I got Maddie to take the money. And they killed him two days later. Those people should be allowed to remain outside the game. And that key idea brings me back to the opening. Let's appraise the other two pieces of our puzzle here. In retrospect, the absence we observe in what I call this empty shot is clearly that of Nacho. And the camera's pause is how we observe a moment of silence for him. Maybe this is the very spot where he fell dead. Maybe it's where his body is buried. The literal truth is kind of irrelevant. Cinematically, this serves as Nacho's gravesite. A gravesite that's marked by a blue flower. That blue flower is the most open-ended image of the opening scene. Yes, the glass leads you to a lot of readings, but it has a tangible function in the story. This flower is more purely symbolic. It plays no role in the story except to comment on it and enrich it. You can read it a lot of different ways by design. Here's how I look at it. Clearly, in some fashion, the flower stands for Nacho. This is essentially his gravesite, after all, his episode. So I think that's a given. Yet there's more to it. Within all this context, I return again to the fundamental coding of lawful blue and lawless gold. To me, this stubborn shred of blue in a desert of gold stands for both Nacho and Mike. And more specifically, that thing they share. These are two characters who live their life on the wrong side of the law and yet still defiantly insist on some sense of order. They play the game, but they want to enforce the rules and really just the one rule. That rule is the people who don't want to play the game don't got to play the game. That's all they ask. But as we know, it's not enough to ask. They have to fight for it. And it's that redeeming thread of blue in their characters that unites Mike and Nacho which in my opinion is why this episode begins the way it does, with a contemplative journey that starts at Mike's vantage point and ends on an emblem of Nacho's final act with a blue flower tying it all together. Let's move to the tanker scene. Like the previous episode, we see Nacho gathering information through a tiny window of light. This time we see his point of view through a rust spot in this oil tanker truck. Unlike the previous episode, though, there comes a moment when someone seems to look back through the hole, and all of a sudden, there is no room left for Nacho to improvise. So he faces an instant choice. It's the Salamancas or the Muck, and he chooses the Muck. Now, to me, Nacho's dead here. I know he gets up out of the oil, and I know he actually dies later in the episode, but when a character in a visual medium descends into an opaque void of pure shadow, death probably should occur to you as one possible interpretation. It's certainly not a celebration of his life, right? The next time we see Nacho's face with this goop trailing across his features, he seems transformed into something like a demon. It's not the last demonic moment he'll have in this episode either. Life, you think of me. Nacho finally emerges from a hole in the top of the tanker, slithering, wheezing. Compared to the similar shot of Lalo in Something Unforgivable, which I've noted before as a shot of Lalo almost rising from the dead, 
I'd characterize this shot of Nacho in kind of the same way, rising from the dead. The difference is that Lalo seemed wounded but unkillable, whereas with Nacho, saturated with sludge and fumes, he's a picture of death. Death hangs over him for the rest of this episode in the imagery and in more explicit terms. Today you are going to die. With that in mind, let's go to the auto repair shop. On a show that uses cars as avatars for the characters, here we see Nacho surrounded by dead cars. There's an air of the afterlife to this quiet automotive resting place in the middle of nowhere. And here comes an angel in a blue jumpsuit who shows Nacho some basic mercy. I don't have a problem with anything I'm seeing here, he says, and fellow, that makes two of us. Say what you will about the cartel, their fitness program is excellent. But the heart of this sequence is, of course, Nacho's call with his father, Manuel. Look at the parallels between the two spaces. Nacho's in an auto repair shop. His dad runs an auto upholstery shop. As you might figure, the look of these places is very similar. Equipment lying around, stuff hanging on the wall, the scattered circles of the hubcaps at the repair shop even echo the haphazard rectangles of the duct system in Manuel's shop. I like that each of these parallels also has an element of contrast in it that suits the scene. Parallels are drawn with the actors as well. Nacho and his father have a similar wardrobe, and they pose the same way as they speak on the phone. They look, for a moment, like they're cut from the same cloth. This is the way Nacho wants to see it. This is the closeness that Nacho wants to feel as he makes this call. He wants to feel as if he's in the same place with his father. And the image emphasizes Nacho and Manuel's closeness accordingly. And yet, at the same time, the spaces are kept vividly distinct by, among other things, the show's fundamental contrast in color. Nacho steeped in gold and his father cast in blue. All the visual cues that say Nacho and his father, they're close, they're family, they're cut from the same cloth, are clashing with this huge, all-encompassing aesthetic signal that says quite loudly, distance and difference. Those are what define the relationship for Manuel. So in those disparate elements of the visuals, we are seeing things as Manuel sees them. Both of the characters' perspectives are baked into the aesthetics of this scene. It's thoughtful, sensitive filmmaking. The distance that Manuel feels is palpable when he asks Nacho, where are you? It's such a small but eerie writing choice to make the line, where are you, and not, what's going on, or is something wrong? At least in translation, it's, where are you? It's about Nacho being in a different place. And the following close-up isolates Nacho next to a wall hanging of the heavenly Madonna that, oh, by the way, happens to be illuminated by the most intense spot of light in the frame. Again, you can detect these whispers of the afterlife in these scenes. Don't make too much of it. It's an accent to the earthbound reality of the scene, but it's there. It's part of the symphony. You know what you have to do, Manuel tells his son. Go to the police. Come to the blue, to my world, Manuel's saying to Nacho, as he said before. Manuel is right when he says that Nacho knows what he has to do, but in Nacho's calculation, it's certainly not come to the blue. He's heading in the opposite direction, deeper into the muck, until he disappears into it. Nacho's so far gone that he can hardly communicate with the blue realm anymore, right? He says essentially nothing of substance to his father, And when he does speak, Manuel struggles to make him out. Like Nacho says, both at the beginning of the call and at the end, his exchange with Manuel is about Nacho hearing his voice because in almost ghostly fashion, hearing is all Nacho can really do across this last thin ethereal tether to the blue world. Of course, moments later on his call to Gus, Nacho has plenty to say. He commands the situation. Unlike the Manuel call, in this conversation, the two ends of the line are portrayed with very similar color grading because we're staying completely in the realm of the gold. And in that realm, Nacho is still very much alive. His voice can still be heard, loud and clear for that matter. He still has, somewhat miraculously, a will to exert on the course of events. I already touched on that shot in Gus's trailer where Nacho contemplates how those events might play out. Let's talk about what comes just before that, this short scene where Mike tells Gus that he intends to come along for Nacho's last stand. You have something more to say? I want to be there. There is a functional quality to this exchange. The episode spends so much energy emphasizing the quiet affinity between Nacho and Mike. Of course, Mike has to be there for Nacho's last moment. 
But there's a little plot hole they have to address if that's going to happen, as Gus helpfully reminds us. The Salamancas know you. They know your face. And Mike has an answer for it. I'm not going to be close enough for them to eyeball me. That little back and forth establishes a narrative basis for Mike's presence in the final scene. It places him on that ridge, in essence. And that's the main business of this little scene outside the trailer, which is why it lasts only half a minute or so. It's necessary exposition. Yet it's also more, in a way that's characteristic of the show's artistry. Among the talents of the Better Call Saul team is their ability to turn storytelling problems into creative opportunities. When they paint themselves into a corner, they paint themselves out in a way that makes you feel it had to be that way all along. The corner here is, as it often is in serialized storytelling, the lines of the plot and the lines of character development, they don't quite point in the same direction at a crucial moment in the story. The character development piece is Mike and Nacho, of course. Their bond in this episode is a natural culmination of their slow development over six seasons. This streak of blue, the mutual respect they have for the boundaries of the game, has been a thread throughout their story. Such as when a disgusted Nacho told Mike that his attempt to expose the Salamancas ended up getting an innocent bystander killed. And that good Samaritan? Hector shot him in the face. The characters have a natural gravity toward each other, not just because of their shared view of their criminal lives, but also, quite simply, Nacho doesn't have a father and Mike doesn't have a son. These people have a matching emptiness in their lives. I wouldn't call Mike a father figure for Nacho exactly. But I think what we have here now is a carrot and stick situation. But throughout the series, he does keep an eye on Nacho and guide the kid in his own way. I prefer the carrot. I think you will too. And Nacho does tend to take Mike's advice. Most notable is the season three dialogue where Mike tells Nacho how to cover his tracks after swapping out Hector Salamanca's heart medication, a pretty crucial conversation. It's an itch about the medicine not working. They're going to look at those pills. You do this, switch them back. Mike and Nacho's relationship allows them to act out in a limited sense this unspoken fantasy of what if my loved one were here with me? Mike admired his son for his goodness. Nacho feels the same about his father. Yet one internal story they both share is, I wonder what it would be like if he just came along with me in the gold realm too. Nacho can't help but wonder what would it be like if Manuel just took the cartel's money? And by the same token, what would it be like if Matty Ermintrout had gone along with the dirty cops? You go along to get along. What if father and son were in the lawless world together? Well, it might look something like Nacho reaching out to Mike when he's in deep trouble. I've been calling Vargas for hours. He hasn't picked up once. He's been trying to get me since he left Salamanca's. And Mike looking out for Nacho's interests at his own peril. You know, because anyone who goes after him is going to have to come through me. Is this a father-son relationship? No, these two guys aren't even close exactly, but they are linked in a meaningful way. Nacho's life and his death mean something to Mike. And Mike is the only one in this cartel world for whom that's true. So in dramatic terms, Mike practically has to be there for Nacho's death. But then there's that wrinkle in the plot side of things, which is Mike has a history with the Salamancas and they'll be there too. The fix for this problem is a familiar one. Have Mike look on with his sniper rifle. That way he's there, as the sniper scope essentially collapses the distance between Mike and the action, but he's there in a way that he remains unseen. It's a fix that does more than fix. It adds to the layers and the tension of the final scene because it multiplies the possibilities for how the climax might play out, as I'll discuss in a moment. Beyond mere exposition, Mike's exchange with Gus also clarifies Mike's motivation, albeit through a sort of misdirect. When Mike justifies his presence at the showdown by arguing that there's a lot of ways this could go south, I should be there for insurance. There are a lot of ways this can go south. We know it's the truth and a lie at once. It's true that they're entering a chaotic situation. The lie is the part that goes unspoken. Mike means for Gus to hear that things could go south for Gus. Meanwhile, we understand as viewers that the heart of Mike's concern is more how things could go south for Nacho. That language of go south, it's a perfect choice of words by Mike. Gus hates south. 
Specifically, he hates all those cartel guys south of the border. His dream is to wall off the South altogether and keep his American empire to himself. South Wall's gonna look beautiful. When Mike says things could go south, it's as if he's playing Gus's psyche like a banjo. I don't believe Gus is totally ignorant about Mike's desire to look out for Nacho. Gus isn't dumb. But once Mike plants that vision in Gus's mind of Salamanca chaos, Gus is helpless to shake it and receptive to Mike's offer of insurance. In effect, Mike's providing backup for both Gus and Nacho. Nacho needs that backup because, good lord, get a load of the plan as Gus and Mike lay it out. Okay, Nacho, here's how it's going to go. Bolsa will want to hear the truth from you. Bolsa's going to be there. He's definitely going to have his little box of torture accessories. He never forgets his little torture box. (laughs) Then, of course, there's the Salamancas. They want to torture you even worse. Their methods take too long for his taste. But don't worry, because at the crucial moment... He puts me down, you mean? Victor will put you out of your misery. Okay, see you tomorrow. Good day tomorrow. It's so perfect that Victor is the keystone. We just saw him earlier this episode when he happily offered to beat the shit out of Nacho. I'll do it. I'll get the hell out of here. In that scene, Nacho remarks, got to make it look real. Got to make it look real, right? No doubt recalling the cold open of season four, Something Beautiful, another instance in which Nacho was bloodied for dramatic effect, and coincidentally, it was Victor and Tyrus who did the bloodying. Small world. Gotta make it look real. So on the big day, Nacho's ability to avoid horrific torture simply depends on the mercy of a guy who once left him to bleed out in the desert. Do it quick before you pass out. So you can understand why Mike wants to be on the scene. Let's talk about those two words that Mike utters once he gets there. The most memorable Mike moment of the episode comes when Nacho raises a gun to Bolsa's head and Mike growls, shockingly, Do it. Do it. There's a lot of storytelling economy in that line. Two tiny words with some considerable history behind them. In the season two finale, Mike peers down his scope from a very similar perch with the intention of gunning down Hector Salamanca, although Nacho unwittingly blocks Mike's first opportunity at a shot. That suspenseful sequence concludes with Mike discovering a note, placed by Frey and his crew, that reads simply, Don't. And he doesn't. He doesn't shoot, thereby fulfilling an accidental prophecy uttered by Nacho in the previous episode. Who's the guy who won't pull the trigger? You. Now, we have Mike urging Nacho, do it. Do what I didn't. Pull the trigger. What does Mike think will happen if Nacho kills Bolsa? The only sure thing is immediate mayhem. And my read is that Mike intends to use that mayhem as cover to exact his own justice. We know he can work quickly with that sniper rifle. Just ask Jimmy. If Nacho pulled the trigger to kill Bolsa, I think it's fair to assume Mike would take out the Salamancas in short order. The question is whether he would have stopped there. After all, it feels like Mike has spent half the season so far with a member of Team Fring pointing a gun at his head. It's the kind of thing that makes a guy a little disgruntled. Now, with the opportunity to place whomever he wants in his sights, perhaps Mike is ready to play the Angel of Death and wipe out the heads of both the Salamanca and Fring operations. The possibility hangs in the air. But we never do find out what Mike would do, because instead of unleashing pure chaos, Nacho uses his last shard of agency to make a rage-filled but more self-contained exit, to die on his terms. It's the literal payoff to the metaphorical death he chose in the oil tanker. This is the moral victory Nacho extracts from his certain doom. To various degrees, everyone there would be delighted to hurt and kill Nacho, and he denies them the satisfaction. The episode ends with the sound of Hector Salamanca pointlessly firing a gun into Nacho's dead body. It's the sound of the very futility and impotence that Nacho wanted Hector to feel. One of the episode's closing shots frames the glass shard in a manner that mirrors the cold open, conspicuously bookending Nacho's story. But the subtler bookend is Mike. 
After all, the very first thing we see in this episode is that long shot of the ridge where Mike positions himself, and the last thing we see is basically a reverse angle as Mike departs that ridge. The episode is framed, in other words, by Mike's vantage point. Because it's not just an episode about Nacho. It's an episode about Mike and Nacho, their connection, and Mike's quiet despair. Because here's a man who has had to assassinate his own friend for breaking the rules, and who now watches yet another kindred spirit drop dead in the name of business. It's a powerful episode for Mike and Nacho, but let's not forget about the Kim and Jimmy storyline. The scene in which Suzanne makes her appeal to Kim harkens back to an exchange from season four's Something Stupid. In that episode, Suzanne, who is at the time unaware of Kim's ties to Jimmy, refers to him as a scumbag, disbarred lawyer. And her only witness is a scumbag, disbarred lawyer who peddles drop phones to criminals. And Kim, after a stunned silence, says, you don't know the whole story, and storms out. For a long time, this indignation was Kim's reflexive response when somebody questioned Jimmy's decency and, by extension, hers. She reacted this way when Kevin Wachtel offered some unsolicited fatherly advice. He could do a whole lot better. And more recently, she was incensed, fatefully so, by Howard's condescending show of concern. It makes no sense to drop a client like Mesa Verde. And I gotta think Jimmy had something to do with that. Now in Rock and Hard Place, it's time for Kim to endure yet another conversation about what are we going to do with Jimmy McGill? Except this time, the premise is that Jimmy's a good guy with the capacity to do the right thing. It's about Kim raising Jimmy's reputation instead of Jimmy tarnishing hers, as it always has been in the past. And what is Kim's response? So, I'm sorry? He practices now under the name Saul Goodman. He's Saul now. Here Suzanne is telling Kim, you were right, I didn't know the whole story. I think the whole story is that Jimmy's basically a good guy. He's involved with a profound miscarriage of justice, and now he'll do what's right. Underneath all of his showiness, he's a lawyer. Sounds like the type of thing Kim used to think about Jimmy, too. And he rewarded her faith by routinely disappointing her. So Kim doesn't talk much about Jimmy anymore, does she? She only wants to discuss Saul. Suzanne's look of bemusement is fantastic. I love the lively performance that the actress, Julie Pearl, brings to Suzanne. And her double take is understandable because to Suzanne, Jimmy and Saul are the same person. Not to Kim. Back in the Jimmy days, Kim might have been pleased to hear a colleague affirm Jimmy's fundamental goodness, but Saul doesn't really have any basic goodness. That's the point of Saul. He's an invention whose defining quality for Kim is that, yeah, he's a scumbag, a useful scumbag, someone who can get his hands dirty on Kim's behalf. As Suzanne lays out all the ways the system failed in the Lalo Salamanca case, We failed. The whole system just failed. Ray Seahorn portrays Kim with this slow burn that shows us Suzanne is successfully appealing to Kim's sense of true justice. Not Kim justice, but true justice. Those two forces are coming into conflict within her. But then the angle changes and Kim resolves the conflict. Her demeanor seems to harden in an instant, in fact, as she invokes Saul's name. It's like she's saying, the system failed here. So what? That's not Saul Goodman's business. He's not here to make the system work. He's here to work the system. One key way that Kim and Saul conceal their dealings with the underworld is by obscuring them behind privilege. Attorney-client privilege, marital privilege. Suzanne is suggesting that Saul abandon the cloak of privilege. Even if Salamanca's dead, his privilege survives. You know that. If the privilege was clean. Which would make Saul useless to the criminal world, which would also render him useless as Kim's dirty dealer. Kim's going to take a hard pass on that idea. So Suzanne and Kim end up in this reversal of roles. Now it's Suzanne advocating for Jimmy, for his fundamental humanity. Suzanne says that if Jimmy cooperates, it proves he's a human being. He's a lawyer and a human being. But Kim frames the deal in more scornful, subhuman terms. First she says to Suzanne, you want him to be a rat. You want Jimmy to rat on a client? Later, she characterizes Suzanne's offer as a 
fishing expedition. It's just a fishing expedition to see if you bite. With the Jimmy McGill goldfish blubbering helplessly in the background, it's rarely been more clear that Jimmy's the fish, especially the way he himself blubbers helplessly in this scene. Twice Jimmy implores Kim to make his decision for him. You think I should do it? And by returning to her animal metaphor... Do you want to be a friend of the cartel, or do you want to be a rat? She makes it clear that the decision has already been made. Typically, when you want someone to make the noble choice, you don't frame that choice in terms of vermin. Suzanne's crucial but understandable mistake was, as she says to Kim, I'm talking to you because I think you'll be more willing to hear what I have to say. Kim's dazzling display of legal scruples out in the lobby serves to solidify Suzanne's conviction. Suzanne wants to cut a deal in service of justice, and Kim is an ally of justice. It's clear. Kim, Kim, do you have a minute? It's a testament to Kim's power of deception that Suzanne so utterly misreads the situation. Kim's do-gooder life is so authentically good that even straight shooters like Suzanne can't discern that Kim's operating by a situational moral code. Because the irony is that while Suzanne says Kim would be more willing to hear her argument... Jimmy, still wounded and drained by the events of Bagman, would be downright eager to hear it. Eager to hear someone like Suzanne call him a human being, hand him a get-out-of-jail-free card, pat him on the back and say it'll be okay. He might collapse sobbing into Suzanne's arms if she did that. He would at least consider the offer strongly. But Kim's credibility in the blue realm and Jimmy's lack thereof makes Suzanne go to her. That gives Kim a commanding influence over the decision, and her choice is for Saul to continue down the dark path. This is Kim's power. To shine as such an irresistible source of light that even close colleagues can't see what she does in the shadows. The morally unencumbered avatar of Saul Goodman is instrumental to this power, and Kim is not about to let Suzanne mess that up with all her crazy talk of the right thing to do. That'll do it for Rockin' Hard Place. Thanks so much for joining me. I sure do appreciate it. And I always love reading your insights in the comments, too. What does this blue flower mean to you? There's a lot of ways to read this show. Don't be afraid to put your interpretation out there. Conversation is part of experiencing art. Keep looking closely. Keep thinking. Keep asking questions about what you see on the screen. And, of course, Namaste 3. So long for now, everybody.